Welcome to this UNF Plus debate on discrimination presented within the Citizens' Corner concept. The debate is produced and hosted by UNET and Sky, as Sky Media Estonia, a member of the UNET Plus network. The debate can be followed live in the European Parliament on the UNET Plus Inside website, on our Facebook profile, as well as on Twitter using the hashtag Citizens' Corner. I'm Brian McGuire. Joining us today to discuss Europe's anti-discrimination law, Mary Honeyball, a Social Democrat MEP from the United Kingdom, uh, Julio uh, Winkler, a Romanian Christian Democrat MEP and Vice Chair of the International Trade Committee, uh, Mario uh, Loristan, an Estonian MEP and Vice Chair of the Social Democrat Group in the European Parliament, Jean Lambert, a Green MEP from the United Kingdom, uh, Dumitru uh, Forna, a member of the e European Economic and Social Committee from Romania, and uh, joining us by telephone today uh, as well from Austria, Dr. Uh, Henri Nickel, Head of Sector Equality and Citizens' Rights at the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights. Uh, Carolina chavez Ferra, a student at the uh, Business School in Brussels, is joining us today also. And uh, we have uh, a, a citizen commentator as well with us, uh, who will participate later on, Stella <coughs> Verlici uh, from uh, Germany and Romania. Welcome, all of you. It's a big subject today. We have a lot of angles that we could uh, cover on this, but let's start with the Equal Treatment Directive. This should have been a priority, a priority for Europe. It's been stuck uh, with the Council for about six years now. Uh, Mary, why are we getting nowhere with this fast? It's a, a real tragedy that we're not, because it's very important legislation and issues which are of great concern. So I think uh, we all feel that uh, it should be moving forward. I, I think there are various reasons. Uh, some of it, of course, has got to do with the economic situation. In times of austerity, equality is always one of the first things to go. And I think we should be mindful of that because, in fact, equality is good for the economy because it does give people more opportunities, they get better training. So it's actually a bit of a short-sighted policy. Okay. Julio, why do you think this is uh, stuck? What needs to be done to change it? I think that it's a very good uh, link that has been just made between crisis and uh, tolerance or crisis and intolerance because I think that uh, the economic and financial crisis which was much debated became a much deeper social crisis and I think that intolerance in the last years has been increasing and if we uh, look to the numbers in every euro barometer in the last years then we see that that uh, that uh, uh, intolerance is increasing and that uh, between 10 and 15 percent of European Union citizens are complaining about uh, the fact that they have been in one way or another discriminated. This is shocking, 10 to 15 percent. That's a very serious issue and, and I think that indeed we should move forward with some European policies and that we should move forward with the uh, anti-discrimination directive. Mario, uh, what do you yeah, think? I think that uh, certainly the crisis uh, has a negative impact on everything in our lives and also that's right that uh, when people are in crisis and they are maybe uh, more unhappy, if they are unhappy, they are more unjust, and uh, if they are more in need, they are more neglected. Uh, that's true, but uh, I will not blame only crisis. It, it's too easy, it's too simple. It's like money is behind everything. I think that there is another, maybe even more important thing, that's a culture. That's understanding or lack of understanding. And uh, as I'm coming from a new member state and uh, from now 28 members, 10 are new ones, meaning that there is a very big and back, bad experience of the communist regime uh, behind that, that uh, in these countries uh, the issue of human rights really didn't exist. Even it was criminalized. So protecting human rights was criminal activity, but also their disabilities were criminalized. Uh, the sexual orientation was criminalized. And uh, in these countries to understand what is really the human right, what is the content of that, it, it, it takes time to change the culture. And if now I look at this committee where I am in, the Libe committee where the, the main discussions are going in, and when I'm listening to some people from, from these countries, and I can understand that for them, for example, to, to feel that people with different sexual orientation, they are just people like every people, okay. it, it's, it's something new. Uh, but I wonder that when I uh, hear, listen to people from so-called old democracies, I sometimes I, I can hear the similar okay. things. Jean, uh, uh, there are a few <laughs> older democracies in the United Kingdom. Uh, there's no lack of education, there's no lack of awareness in the UK. Uh, do you see uh, discrimination 
growing? It's certainly true that discrimination in some areas is growing. If you listen to people from some of the disability organisations, for example, they report more and more sort of hate speech against them, people suffering even violence, indiscriminate violence in the streets. Um, you know, it, it, it's not massive, but it's there. It has an impact on their lives, their willingness to, to actually go out. And part of that they certainly see reflected in terms of some of the measures that have been taken during okay. the crisis um, in, in the way in which cuts in social benefits have been presented almost as if somehow people with disabilities um, you know, are scroungers, are frauds, are a cost to the system. Uh, similar thing I think we need to be aware is happening in a number of our member states and older people with this push about the sort of the generational, um, you know, somehow it, it, the older people have it so much okay. better. It's something rising in the UK. So it's, I, I think it's different to some of the older states and why we're not moving forward. It's cost, it's okay. prejudiced, and all member states have to agree. Okay, Dimitri, we all, to some degree, have something which we can be discriminated against for. Why does this not change? In, in such a, a media-sensitive age, and people are so aware of so many differences, why do we see so many divisions continuing, if not growing? That is a good question. Homo homini lupus. This is a old phrases of the philosophers. So <laughs> the human nature didn't change too much in the 2000 years. So we have a historical background, which... Uh, brings us a lot of details related to this. All the big empires have been built around the idea that will ensure better life for their people, their citizens. The citizenship which has not been always taken for granted was, has to be won, the citizenship. And the same is happening now in Europe. If you go in the, from another member state to another more developed member state, you will need to win that citizenship. And these di discussions, if we like it or not, they are exist. Okay. So it's a philosophical and sociologic matter uh, related to this issue. I suppose the rest is a declaration of principles. Okay. In reality, we need to build those institutions to help us in terms of culture, education, to advance forward. Okay, let's see if we can bring Dr. Nicola in a moment just on the phone. Uh, Carolina, you, you have a, a generation which uh, is a melting pot of Europe, this is your generation, that you haven't known anything different. Uh, do you, amongst your peers, do you see uh, a, a level of integration which didn't exist before, which you, when you observe other generations? Um, well, <coughs> what, I, what I see is that, uh, well, I've always been in a European context, so uh, we, uh, me and my friends, we always um, integrate ourselves very good with um, with other people because we all have our differences. But we can see that sometimes there are uh, there are some people that can't understand us. Why? Um, because we we have a way of thinking that is unusual of others and. That, that can create some some complexes. Okay, uh, Mary, do you observing people like Nigel Farage and politicians who are perhaps on the more populist end of the scale? Uh, this sense of it's their fault uh, is this something which uh, continues to exist in Europe because of austerity, or is it simply this is old politics and and it's just easier to make this argument and a lazier form of politics? Well, it's both. Um, Sadly, there are still in Europe people like Nigel Farage, and sadly, we have to actually debate with Nigel Farage in this institution. Um, and he is, of course, uh, lead, uh, a leading figure in our general election at home at the moment. Does but he listen when you debate with him? Not at all. You don't think he's ever listened so he's to anyone in his life. Prefixed opinions. <laughs> Very fixed opinions. And actually, I, I think um, to put the record straight in the UK, he will not get a lot of support at this election. It has been blown up out of all proportion. I think UKIP will get one or maybe two seats in the House of Commons. Be surprised if it's more than that. So although they're there and he is a forceful individual, yeah. I don't believe that it's anywhere near an important view across most of the UK. 
UK and certainly not in London. I mean, London is one of the most culturally, ethnically diverse it's cities. It's a country unto itself. It, well, not quite, but it's one of the, it is one of the most diverse cities in the whole of the EU. And, you know, we're very proud of that, to and be Boris, honest. And Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, he's, he has a different approach when he speaks uh, about the, the people of London. He, he really recognises the, the differences across and will defend them. Uh, do we need to see this more at, at a European level, uh, Guido? Uh, yes, yes, of course. And uh, what I would like to remark is that uh, it is uh, so, or it seems so easy to discriminate. For example, uh, for example, we ourselves, or the Commission, the proposal of the Commission, is making a sort of, a sort of differentiation between minorities. There are some minorities which do not exist from the point of view of Commission. I am a member of an ethnic minority in my country. I am a Hungarian from the Hungarian community in Romania, which is a quite powerful community. And I wonder if uh, the proposed directive is speaking about religion and belief, if it's speaking about racial and ethnic origin, and if it's speaking about nationality in Europe in the sense of the Lisbon Treaty, why should not speak about the uh, uh, autochthonous national minorities, which might not be a very special issue maybe in some parts of Europe, but in Central and Eastern Europe, in, with no doubt, they are a very, very special topic. And uh, uh, unfortunately, speaking about the Libe Committee, there is a report in preparation okay. now about the situation of the human rights inside the EU in the last two years. And this uh, draft report is establishing very clearly that, uh, uh, unfortunately, discrimination exists and victims of discrimination exist. And it speaks also about multiple discrimination and indirect discrimination, which are very, very perfidious forms of discrimination and which maybe also is supported every day by ethnic minorities in Europe. Okay, uh, Jean, I'll come back to you just a moment, Mary. Jean, when we, we have this case in the UK where uh, people uh, who refuse to bake a cake for a, a, a gay wedding um, are facing prosecution, the people, the bakers would say, um, we respectfully don't want to do this because it, it, it discriminates against our freedom of religion, to exercise our religion. How do you reconcile these uh, kind of differences? Well, I think to some extent they're reconciled with, with difficulty and this is you know, what the human rights sort of convention and indeed the, 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 the um, law as it is in the UK recognises. On the other hand, if you were offering a commercial service, then, you know, you have made a choice about what it is you're going to do. The issue about how you then choose your customers is, you know, the, what our law is saying is you cannot, you cannot discriminate on that basis. If you are offering a service, that's it. You know, people buy your service, they, they shouldn't be having to sort of check what the beliefs are of the service provider in order to be able to have that. But I think it does illustrate, you know, why it is that in a number of member states where you know, they're waiting for the European law, the UK has gone ahead on this. These are some of the difficulties and that people always, f a lot of people feel that they are going to be the losers in this, whereas actually it is about sort of balancing the way in which we live together, but giving a legal framework to that okay. so that, you, you know, if the authorities are there and in place, you can actually okay. contest it. Now, uh, it would seem that religions of all types are being discriminated against to some degree as well. Would that be fair? Uh, it's uh, maybe difficult to say because uh, uh, that that uh, maybe more problem. What was uh, told by our young uh, young colleague that that uh, people who th who feel and think in a different way because of culture, because of religion, because of upbringing, and so on, uh, they they feel discriminated when their difference is taken as something negative. And I suppose that's important that we understand that we all are different. In some, in some sense, we, everybody of us is minority compared to some other. And that's why we speak about universal human right to be tackled as an equal, to be taken as a human being, not as some, some, somebody with some feature which is making him worse than other person. And I, I really don't agree what was said before that the, the basic philosophy of humankind is philosophy of hatred. I suppose that the, as, as, as fundamental also is philosophy of love, of universal love, universal recognition. And I, so, so I hope very much that European development will be based on that philosophy. Is this a philosophy of survival, Mitro? 
it's a philosophy of reality. We look what's happening around us. <laughs> <laughs> it's real politics, finally. We, uh, we don't like this in Europe. I don't like this. I'm coming from trade union. We'll always we have principles. We try to respect principles, but in reality, we respect principles. Because when we look at what is happening, for example, for uh, workers from other countries in other countries going to, to find a new future, it's quite complicated, even inside European Union, not to talk what is happening with the people from outside Europe. It's what we have today and not what we discuss all the time. If you looked at the Council, they debated in 10 occasions about this. Everybody was agreeing with the fact that they do not have to ex discriminate. But uh, when they started to discuss applied, when how this directive would be involved, you will see Germany, Malta, Netherlands, rich countries, which raised concerns related to the financial impact of this. So if it's to talk about principles, this means also money. And the money has to be given by somebody. It, here is the European Parliament, which should advance with the principles and to transform the homo homini libus in <laughs> your principle. Should we be complaining <laughs> about politicians who really are just representing the, the reality on the ground? Now, the Council, if they can't deliver these policies at home, why are we sitting here in the European Parliament saying, well, the people at home should just take it anyway? It is, yes, it's, it's, it's about that. The people are waiting for results. They look in Romania. We have a lot of people with disabilities. They have the rights which we stipulate in the directive, not. Because why? Because of many factors, cultural, educational, budgetary, and so on. Lack of awareness among our uh, politicians and our public administrations, and so on and so on. They go to other laborers, uh, workers in the uh, United Kingdom or in Sweden, and they will face another reality. They will have to face another population which have different mindset. We have our mindset. We interact with them. Okay. Unavoidable discrimination will appear. What we will do to, to, uh, to avoid that? Maybe to know better. Okay. Us. Julio, next steps. What do, what do we need to do now? Uh, I think, and you were speaking about the European Parliament and its role, and I think that really we do have a very important role. First of all, the role of listening and understanding, and then the role of pushing forward, because if we do not push forward, then who should? And I think that we also uh, should listen very carefully to Carolina and what she said, because, because uh, after all, we should do policies for the young people. Uh, what I want to assure you, Carolina, is that the multiple layers of identity will develop. Maybe 10 years from now, you will have, or your generation also, will have some other issues which uh, 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 you will feel important, some, 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 some other layers of your uh, European or local identity, uh, or cultural identity, what we should do in the Parliament is to push forward, to debate and to push forward and to try to win also such desperate looking situations that those of the Council now in this moment, because it's not the only issue which is blocked for years and years in the Council, maybe under the pressure of the crisis, and I have to speak about the crisis because sure. I think that it's important, maybe under the pressure of the crisis, maybe under the pressure of what is happening at the borders of Europe and the tragedies that are happening at the borders of Europe, we will succeed, the Parliament will succeed to push forward the other okay. European institutions. Mary, if we go down the road of the United States where everybody is asserting their rights and uh, that they feel discriminated if you look the wrong way and on rifle association, things like that. Do we really want a fixed uh, directive which guarantees your rights or do we need something more flexible so that we don't end up in a, an all or nothing situation like uh, we see in the United States? Well, the United States is not necessarily all or nothing. I mean, in certain areas it is. Um, and it, actually, in certain areas, the United States is quite appalling, particularly on race. So, and, and it's not a helpful example. I know people in the EU don't like looking to the United States with some justification. Um, I, I think in, in the EU, and I, I do agree that we, we should be taking a lead. And the history of human rights and equality legislation is that somebody or a group of people have to be prepared to do that. And once you've introduced the legislation, it does eventually become accepted. I mean, there have been huge changes after the, over the last 30, 40 years. What do you notice is the biggest difference? Well, actually, I notice particularly the position of women, which has changed enormously. Um, we've now got a parliament here, which is 37% women. We're not quite so good in the UK. But it wasn't so long ago that women were hardly represented at all in politics. And that 
that's been a massive change, and that's seen throughout levels of society. There are far more women but now working. Is this working a case of and political attitude, or is this because work conditions changed, which allowed women to move out of the, the, the home and into the workplace in general, well, and then into politics? Well, it's both. I mean, these things tend to work together, okay. and I don't think you can legislate sensibly on equalities unless you have some measure of consensus within the, the country or the jurisdiction that you are. And that is there, but that's all, all a whole process of changing attitudes and moving forward. Okay. And I think that is a big role that we have to play. Okay, Mario. Yeah, but I, th I think also that the European Parliament in this sense is very important, that it's very unique. Because here we all, who are very different, we are pressed together in one space, in one time, and we can talk to each other. So uh, sometimes uh, this kind of common rules that could be accepted somewhere there by somebody whom we even don't see, don't know. But here we see each other, here we can explain why and what we feel a different way, how we understand a different way, and come to some common ground. And I suppose that's, that's the most important thing, to do this common what's legislation. The incentive? Why, why, yeah. What's the incentive for people to change their behavior? You know, do, do we penalize them in court? Do we fine them? Or do we just have an economic benefit where people have to wake uh, up and see? I think that in this, uh, this question, the most important thing really is to have this mutual, mutual uh, empathy, understanding, feeling, that really in, in basically pe people are, are uh, similar, as they are, have the same kind of emotions, same kind of rights. And that is coming from this mutual communication. It's not coming from above. It can come and but must the, come from, the, from inside. Dimitri would say, well, inside they just, they're just out for themselves. Is that right? No, I, I agree with the idea that the social and uh, civic dialogue might play an important role in this issue. But also we have these media institutions which can contribute a lot to the atmosphere in Europe. Well, if we look what is happening in uh, all over the countries, you see behaviors which are uh, not very much in favor of what we're talking in the directives. So the events are presented in a manner that give um, um, give more chances to the emotion than to the ration. And in Europe, we talked always about the, the rationale, the, the, the ra raison, no? Uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité, mais afterwards, what he's talking about, it's the emotion. And if you have uh, a guy like Farage, it's saying that uh, millions of Romanians will invade uh, London, uh, London uh, United Kingdom will be sunk by Romanians. Of course, this will start an hysteria and so on. The people will, will be in a very difficult uh, situation. So I think the media plays an important role. And like you, Euronet Plus, one of them, Euronews, we have two already uh, broadcasting companies, uh, European broadcasting companies, which can help a lot in this respect. But all member states and all the national television should contribute to this goal. Okay, Mary has to leave us now. Thank you for Thank her you. time. Uh, Carolina, uh, you, which country would you most like to live in because of its fairness? I like Belgium. <laughs> yeah, I like living here. Um, where, where would you not like to live? Generally, well, um, I know there are some places that is good to be for holidays, but otherwise, um, I don't have a really a country that where I don't want Isn't to. Isn't it live. true that a lot of country the citizens leave countries which have a, a weaker legal framework where there's less protection, and uh, those that have stronger protection against discrimination seem to be doing economically better? Is that fair, Mary? I think you could make a, an argument out for that. Certainly people do leave countries because they face well, often worse than discrimination. They, f they face violence and uh, all sorts of things. And that's why we have an, a system of asylum. So there are people in the world who clearly suffer a lot for their But their still within, within Europe, uh, the economic migrants moving within Europe as well from one country to another and the discrimination sense of lack of opportunity, maybe because of corruption uh, as well, uh, encourages people to go to more fair systems. Possibly. Um, I, I'd like to see some evidence okay. for that. Uh, I mean, I think, I think there is you know, a degree of evidence for that, that if you look at, for example, some of the research that's been done about French high flyers in the UK, okay. part of that is that they, f they feel free to actually develop, not be trapped, as it were, by their education or, French or tax whatever. System. Or, well, French taxes and we'll leave aside. I think we should maybe move that way. But, um, you, you know, when you look, for example, at 
people of Roma background and the horrendous discrimination that they suffer in a number of European countries. It's not surprising they move somewhere where they think the law actually works or they hope it does. Faith identity is another one where people want to be in a country where they feel free to actually practice their faith without people looking at them as if they're second-class citizens. So I think this does matter and I think it's really important that we actually try to have sort of stand, similar standards right across the European okay. Union. You do. Also very important speaking about legal framework yeah. uh, is uh, the implementation of the law because mm -hmm. we of course have various legal frameworks. Some of them are converging between the member states and the European level. Some of them maybe re reflect a sort of cultural identity or a sort of historical identity. But implementation that's the key issue. And that is where the indirect uh, discrimination appears because for example in my country you might have a school in mother tongue for minorities, but it might just happen that it is 30 or 40 kilometers from your domicile, and then you have the right, you have the legal framework, everything is looking wonderful, but you cannot exercise your rights. So this is also a crucial issue. And in this, of course, you can see citizens who are, uh, may I use a strong term, who are getting sick of existing legal framework, but not applicable, not applied, or not enforced, or not insufficiently working legal framework. And then they say, okay, thank you, but no thank you. Okay. Dimitri, is there a single element of the discrimination laws which you think is, is fundamentally lacking in application, which really needs to be taken and enforced and would make a substantial difference? We in the committee, in the European Economic and Social Committee, we dealt with this in 2009 when was the first discussion seriously on the directive and we adopted uh, an opinion on that. And uh, one of the concerns are related with, um, with the labor market because that was mainly related with the activity of the unions which put pressure, but also the employers' organizations, they've been very much interested to solve this issue. You remember all this discussion about Balkanstein uh, directives and other issues, but uh, now uh, in the last period we discuss a lot about the discrimination which occur between the people moving inside Europe. It's not only about Romania. Okay. And it's also the Spaniards who are going to Germany, Italians are working sure. in other parts. Well, the uh, gender as well. Why is it that when women in general are paid about 30% less, that still they're discriminated in the marketplace? You would think economics would say, well, if they're 30% cheaper, we should employ more of them. It's, that is a cultural matter in Europe. Uh, we, we believe, we always believe that Europe is very good in this. Uh, we, we, we gave the women a place. Uh, the women won, won a place in the history. So they are in a better position like in the Muslim world, but are places in the world where the, the things are better even in Europe. So uh, I, I don't know. I don't think we are a panacea of the rights for the uh, for the women here. So still, it is this problem. In Romania, it was necessary to build an agency okay. for anti-discrimination for women, but an agency which didn't work because really was not a political will to maintain this. Okay. So it's like it's a, this kind of machista uh, a policy, you know, like the Spaniards. They okay. said it's it's not a really uh, a willingness. To, to deal with that. We still see governments which has a problem to nominate women in the, in the, the most uh, highest uh, bodies in Europe. Okay, is this a, a place where the European Parliament can really make a difference, Mary, that where the institutions are failing in terms of gender discrimination, for example, that the European Parliament itself can put pressure on a nation or a region to, to change? Well, we, we do that obviously through legislation and there is significant legislation on rights at the workplace and anti-discrimination, and interestingly, um, and discrimination and gender discrimination was in fact in the Treaty of Rome in 1957. It's always been a fundamental issue for the EU and one of the things that we do. So I think it does make a difference and I, I think the legislation which has been introduced here over the years has forced member states to think about gender discrimination and to deal with it. That's not to say that uh, we're there yet. There's still a long okay. way to go and there are some areas where it's very difficult. For instance, the gender pay gap across Europe is still around about 16%. But we haven't been able to legislate on that because it's proved very difficult to find something that okay. works in all member states. But we're doing it and we're talking about it, and I think that in itself okay. is valuable. Jean, do you think that measurement of the problem is a key starting point? Uh, the F uh, Fundamental Rights Agency, uh, it says that part of the problem is the disaggregated ga data, and you need to collect this to be able to measure where the problems are and then implement it 
uh, solution. Are we looking too broadly at the solution and the problem across Europe that we need to, to focus more specifically? Well, I think certainly having sort of the comparable data really, really helps. Then you also get into some of this, ba this debate between different member states about countries that are willing to collect data on certain issues, okay. others that won't touch it. So you've got a, a, a battle going on there. But yes, you need the information. You also need people to, uh, the whole dissemination for that people are aware of their rights, uh, as has been said, so that, you, you know, for example, we were talking earlier about austerity. One of the things that you've seen cut in a lot of countries is the budget for the equalities commissions. Now, these are the people who are supposed to help people actually assert the rights that they already have, particularly within the labour market, and those have been weakened. So I think, you know, the political will part of this is it's not just what you put on the statute book, it's also how people know about it and how people can actually assert their rights, implement the rights so that they have. education first. It's education is part of it, but, you know, have a legal framework because otherwise, you know, you're just educating people to be nice and there's nothing to back it. Okay, let's bring in Stella Velici. Stella, do you have a question for a panel? Yes, um, thank you very much for the invitation. Just one moment, we'll put the microphone up for you. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Let's try yes. again, Stella. Go yes. Ahead. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I have um, two small questions from Mr. Winkler. Um, Romania is an EU country and the democracy allows uh, a respect of minority rights and every person um, in any position who commits a discrimination can be taken to the court. My question is, why do you want more authority for the Hungarian, for example, for the Hungarian minority in Romania? Okay. Uh, the 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 it's small one second question is: Can you use better the EU financial funds that people remain in Romania and don't go away? Okay, Stella, thank you so much for uh, for those questions. Julio, first question to you. Well, uh, we need a conference starting now and having at least two hours to, 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 to <laughs> try to explain a little bit about those questions. But I think that, uh, first of all, uh, I have to go back to what I just said. Okay. Difference between the existing legal framework and the application of the legal framework. And there is a long list of, uh, of, uh, of issues in which, uh, for example, education in mother tongue, for example, participation in administration, for example, different forms of local auto uh, autonomy, uh, and uh, uh, different uh, forms of, uh, of self-determination and of decisions okay. uh, of cultural and other aspects. So is this really a maths exercise? Where you need uh, to a maths exercise, mathematics, where you need to allocate quotas and fill the quotas? Uh, that no, I think that the quota system is just one part of the solution. The other part of the solution is education, of course. And the third part of the solution is a legal system which should okay. be on constitutional level because we have a legal system on law, on a level of the laws, but of course you have to have something on constitutional level which should uh, uh, make you feel indeed equal part of that society, okay. which is the society of Romania, the Romanian society. Okay. And, uh, and, and uh, those issues, of course, we have been uh, uh, on a long journey, okay. 25 years of positive changes and of results, and also I think we have uh, uh, an equally long journey in front okay. of us. I and uh, it, for the second, uh, for the second sure. uh, question, which was, which was uh, formulated, of course, uh, I know very well uh, that uh, Romania, unfortunately, is lagging behind from the point of view of uh, uh, effective utilization of the EU funding. Okay. We are at the beginning, always I said that, uh, that uh, uh, you cannot, from kindergarten, you cannot go to university directly. You have first to, 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 to go to school. We are on this path of eight years of membership of the European Union. We have to do a lot of work. In terms but of nation building, eight years is not that long. Uh, but again, you have the law. In yeah. this case, you have the financing, but you have to do the utilization. You have to learn the lesson, you have to learn efficiency, and you have to learn implementation in such a way okay. that uh, we, uh, uh, you see, we are now prepared to enter in the mechanism of introducing the euro as payment, uh, okay. met, uh, uh, as, as currency, currency in, uh, in Romania. But from uh, uh, real convergence terms, we are far from being okay. prepared. So if we introduce euro two years from now, that would be a national catastrophe in Romania. So it's about, uh, pace. It's about uh, uh, preparing, it's about exercise, okay. it's about efficiency, and probably, probably, uh, a better usage of the EU funds will not solve okay. the issue of people leaving Romania, because it not, did not solve the issue of people leaving 
Spain, maybe, right. or people leaving Greece or Italy, or Germans leaving for the United States. Okay. There was an interesting case in Northern Ireland where they, over 25 years almost as well, they're rebuilding the police service. And uh, they tried the quota system to bring more Catholics and more and Irish nationals into the, the police service. And uh, the Irish uh, nationals, the Catholics from Northern Ireland, didn't want to join. But to meet the quota, uh, Polish Catholics applied and they received positive uh, discrimination. So the police force in Northern Ireland now has a sizable portion of Polish uh, ethnic uh, uh, constituents as well, simply to make up these quotas. Mary, do you support the use of quotas? I do. Maybe that's a bad okay. example. Those are very special circumstances. Um, certainly, in terms of what we've been doing here, and at the end of the last mandate, there was a lot of discussion about having quotas for women on company boards, um, which I, I've supported very much because... Well, Vivian Redding seems to be taking all the board positions for all women across Europe currently, <laughs> yes. single-handedly. <laughs> <laughs> that aside, um, I mean, what, what, what happens in organisations is inevitably that, that people appoint people similar to themselves. So it perpetuates, it. so men being in, in charge in organisations perpetuates itself. And it's very hard to get through that, however good you are. So quotas actually does allow women to arrive and get positions. And I, I, all the time people say to me, well, isn't this just tokenism? Um, will women be able to do it when they get there? Well, they, they can. I mean, women are just as good as men. And when they get to these positions, they're, better, they're, Mary, just as, they're even better. I didn't like to say it, but thank you. So it's not tokenism. It's just a means of ending that discrimination against women. Okay. Jean, how do we end discrimination against men? Mm -mm -mm. Well, you uh, <coughs> for that assumes that there is. I, I, th I think there, there are some places now where there are some growing concerns. Um, in education okay. it is one, actually, in terms of particularly, it, it's not just a gender, but it's a class issue too. And that, that is something where sort of working class white boys in the UK are the ones tending to fall behind. So actually there is an element of, of truth with, within that. I think that generally men have been very good at actually protecting their positions. Um, I think, you know, that one of the ways in which we actually move towards ending sort of discrimination in a variety of fields is that we actually have to look at ourselves as well and our own attitudes and what it is that we perpetuate. Because as Mary was saying, if all of us are actually recruiting people that seem like us, then sometimes actually having the law there to remind you that really you have to make sure that your recruitment processes or whatever are actually fair across the board is a very important reminder. And of course, you know, one of the things that we're also hearing is from a lot of the big companies in Europe are very keen on an equalities agenda okay. and really working with, in particular, the European Commission on that sort of diversity agenda. So for us in the Parliament right. who need to commit some of our colleagues about the value of the anti-discrimination agenda, the business case can be a useful one there for okay. people who don't want to listen to other things. Dimitri, when you're making arguments uh, in trade unions, do you find a way to explain to uh, businesses that it's in their interest to adopt anti-discrimination policies for economic reasons? Yes, of course. We, we try to give a label to this process, as in every aspect of our uh, debates, political debates, for when we talk about green aspects, we put a label on that. And when we talk about discrimination, also we put a label because many companies have this program of CCR corporate social responsibility where where the things like discrimination are integrated already okay. so many transnational corporations try to to look good in this respect uh, but of course we have a problem with the small and medium sized enterprises which they find very difficult to apply some of them and the most complicated are the issues related with the disability persons okay. because it's not only if you are a disabled person it's also a, if you are a person which take care about the disabled person, because when they found out that you are in this position, they avoid to employ to hire you, and that creates huge amounts of discrimination in many countries. This kind of people, even uh, if you talk in the case of a, a mother, which is a, a <laughs> has a child, a, a small child, he, he always it's a face of discrimination when it's to be hired because they try to avoid this kind of situation. Okay. Uh, it's a chart on our Twitter page if you want to take a look at it and it's indicating the lack of public awareness about anti-discrimination legislation and uh, 
it would seem to me that when you're falling below 50% of public awareness about anti-discrimination, there's a big job to be done and maybe some of our, our cash should be spent <coughs> on simple education programs. You know. I think that uh, we, uh, we have the framework because uh, if you look uh, very attentively to the 2014-2020 uh, multi-annual framework and the programs there, uh, then you find out that you have uh, lots of uh, possibilities. Also, that's uh, very important that uh, really? it's not only about uh, uh, specialized programs, but also about uh, cross-cutting programs. So you have to cooperate. Local authorities, European authorities, specialized agencies, and national budgets also have to put in some input to these programs. Okay. And then I think that it's about education, okay. and that's very important. Can we bring Dr. Nickel in? Is he on the line? Yes, I am, yeah. Sorry, sir. We, we th I thought we'd lost you earlier. Let's, no, uh, no, let's no. give the last uh, minute or so before we round up to you. You've listened to, to this debate. I've just called out your, your uh, chart on, on uh, Twitter here as well. From what you've heard, what needs to be done? Yes, well, I've heard a lot. And I think one thing that we've heard a lot is people focusing on what doesn't work and like the situation, how the situation is bad. But I think we have to remem remind ourselves that the EU has a still has one of the most advanced legal frameworks when it comes to countering discrimination. And the Equal Treatment Directive would supplement and complement that, um, that framework. So it's extremely important not to lose that, uh, that uh, of, out of sight and not focus necessarily on, no, it's not working because of this, because of that, but really to make every effort possible and use every means at our disposal to ensure the adoption of the Equal Treatment Directive. How do you get that done? Well, there's a question of political will that was mentioned. There's a question of like making people understand the extent of discrimination, for example, like uh, that, you know, our, our survey showing that uh, LGBT persons or uh, persons or Jewish persons feel discriminated against, for example, that shows that discrimination is a daily reality. And then you have to acknowledge that it is a reality. Okay. Do, not, do yeah. we need to focus on particular minorities or particular strands of discrimination, or do we simply need to focus on the big picture that discrimination of any sort isn't acceptable? Well, I think the, the, the clue is in the title. No, it's equal treatment irris uh, irrespective of religion, disability, age, sexual orientation. Uh, so it's for everybody, and uh, not having this hierarchy of, gro hierarchy of grounds. So uh, in, that, in that sense, if there is to be an equal treatment directive, it should okay. treat all grounds on equal footing. Who's good at uh, anti-discrimination policy in Europe? Which countries? <laughs> this is a question that you would have to ask the European Commission, I'm afraid. I'm sure they'd be delighted to answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, who, from the, the chart, I can see that uh, there's a high awareness in Poland. Why is that? Um, you're asking me or you're yeah, asking? Uh, yeah. um, I, to be honest, I wouldn't be able to tell you why there's a high, aware, high, aware, high awareness in Poland. It might be that in Poland they have more anti-discrimination awareness raising campaigns as in other places, but this information I don't have. Okay. But what is important is that there needs to be awareness raising activities okay. by a number of actors to ensure that people are aware of their rights and also of what is discrimination so they can actually okay. go and seek redress against it. Okay, let me bring back to the panel here uh, as well. Miri, do we need uh, real ambassadors for anti-discrimination in Europe? And they don't necessarily need the title, but we need people who represent, at a, at, like Hillary Clinton, for example. Nobody can doubt that Hillary is, is whether you want her or not, is, is ready for the presidency if, if she's able to get it. This, is this the kind of personality we need to really change uh, the, the framework? I think it's one of the things we need. I, I don't think there's any one, one thing above everything else but I, I think people who are strong on anti-discrimination who are prepared to go out and talk about it and campaign okay. are important that's a good quick summary and basically equality versus austerity that's where we started the debate today if economic conditions aren't right there's much more likelihood of inequality and uh, people exercising the intolerance and tolerance uh, is lacking across Europe. 10, 15 percent of uh, people in the EU feel discriminated at some point, and uh, it's important to realise that discrimination uh, comes across uh, comes across in many different strands that we may not see uh, across those different strands of self culture and uh, lack of understanding. We inherit our, uh, our our bigotry to some degree as well, but education has a way to to resolve that with persistence as well. Social benefit cuts were were uh, raised here as well that uh, we tend to penalise 
those who may be weakest in society uh, because they may not have a strong voice. Uh, so advocates for those who uh, need the assistance uh, to get uh, a foot up the ladder. And uh, nature didn't really change at any point, said uh, Demetra as well. I'm sure a lot of people will agree with that, but uh, nature uh, can be corralled into a particular direction if we're clear enough with, uh, with it as well. Europe is full of ethnic differences, but uh, we've done 60 years plus of, of uh, with an absence of, of uh, substantial war. And uh, that must say something for itself as well, that uh, Romania is uh, eight years in, in a, a strong progress towards uh, a more uh, fair and, and uh, equitable society. And uh, no doubt there's much more work to be done there, as, as Julio said today as well. And the legal framework, implementation of the law. Without the implementation of the law and enforcement of the law, we don't go anywhere. Nobody has any incentive uh, to do anything. And as we wait for Hillary Clinton to uh, <laughs> climb the podium and give her acceptance speech and declare that discrimination is over, let me thank our guests today as well, Mary Honeyball, uh, Julio Winkler, uh, Mario Lurston, uh, Jean Lambert, Dimitri Forna, uh, Dr. Henri Nickel uh, joining us by phone today as well, Carolina Chavez-Ferrer and uh, Stella Verlici. Thank you all so much today. Thank you. Thank you.